reading from the book of Exodus. Early in the morning, Moses went up to Mount Sinai, as the Lord had commanded him, taking along the two stone tablets. Having come down in a cloud, the Lord stood with Moses there and proclaimed his name, Lord. Thus the Lord passed before him and cried out, The Lord, the Lord, a merciful and gracious God, slow to anger and rich in kindness and fidelity. Moses at once bowed down to the ground in worship. Then he said, If I find favor with you, O Lord, do come along in our company. This is indeed a stiff-necked people, yet pardon our wickedness and sins and receive us as your own. The word of the Lord. A reading from the second letter of St. Paul to the Corinthians. Brothers and sisters, rejoice. Mend your ways, encourage one another. Agree with one another, live in peace. And the God of love and peace will be with you. Greet one another with a holy kiss, and the holy ones will greet you. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with all of you. The word of the Lord. be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. Glory to you, O Lord. God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him might not perish, but might have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him will not be condemned, but whoever does not believe has already been condemned because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. The Gospel of the Lord. couple of announcements this morning before diving into our homily in earnest. The first is that on Thursday we celebrate the feast of Corpus Christi, 
that is to say, the feast of the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, as such, we're going to have two hours of exposition of the Blessed Sacrament. The church will be opened, and uh, people will be invited uh, to come and to spend some time in adoration of our Lord in the Blessed Sacrament. That will begin at 6 p.m. on Thursday, and it will conclude at 8 p.m. on Thursday. The uh, social distancing rules, hand sanitizing, and um, face masking rules will be in effect. So nobody will be admitted without a face covering, and we will keep an eye on how many people are in the church at any one time. But we wanted to offer folks an opportunity to be directly in the presence of the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, this Thursday from 6 p.m. until 8 p.m. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. The words of St. Paul to the Corinthians today could not be more prescient. Brothers and sisters, rejoice. Mend your ways. Encourage one another. Agree with one another. Live in peace. And the God of love and peace will be with you. Greet one another with a holy kiss. All the holy ones greet you. And indeed, in a time of uh, massive demonstrations and civil disturbance, and a sense that there is something wrong, there is some discord, some disorder within our society that has given birth to these demonstrations and uh, sometimes to this violence, we've got a lot on our minds and we wanna see how we can live the exhortation that St. Paul gave to the Corinthians. And we might remember that the Corinthians were famous for being a partisan people, for being broken into different camps, both within the church and without. And so they understood what it meant to live in a divided society and what it meant to yearn for a more just and equitable uh, existence. On this Trinity Sunday, in light of the demonstrations and the damage that have so affected our city, I don't think that it'll be surprising to anyone to hear a priest say, God is the answer. But as with so many parts of our Catholic life, we dare not leave things at the level of a pleasant maxim, God is the answer. We do not want the gospel to be relegated to the realm of trite sloganism. The great liturgical cycle that we have completed just this past week with Pentecost is a liturgical cycle of love. It began with the Father's saving love for mankind at Advent. It proceeded through the sending of that saving love in the life, death, and resurrection of the Son at Christmas, Lent, and Easter. And the cycle culminates with the enduring presence of that love in the person of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. We are a people whose entire religious understanding is personal in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. This Trinitarian saving love in its conception, its sending, and its endurance among us is meant to answer the deepest questions of the human person. Who am I? What is the meaning of life and of suffering? What happens to me after I die? And certainly all of this applies to the present moment. These great existential questions which St. John Paul II uh, elucidated in his uh, encyclical Fides et Ratio, uh, these are the questions that all people ask. And all iniquities, all problems rise when these questions are not answered to the satisfaction of the human heart. The saving love that we are talking about today on this Trinity Sunday, this saving love is not too difficult to understand. It is not ethereal or ephemeral. The word is near you, brothers and sisters, in your mouth and in your heart, as St. Paul had preached to the Romans. Because this word becomes flesh and is able to relate to us, explain himself to us in Christ. 
and in Christ present in all believers, right? Because it came down in Christ and is present in the person, in the flesh of believers, we can take our time, understand this word, ask questions about this word. Literally, we can flesh it out in our own existence. And that's a beautiful thing. And it's all based on the fact that the word was incarnate in the person of Jesus. Two things happen. One, we are comforted that we can understand and live the love of God. And two, this incarnate personal love between the person of the Son and us. This personal love directs us. It exhorts us. It shows us the pathway forward for how we are to live the love that we've received and understood. In the words of the church's social teaching, political community finds its authentic dimension in its reference to its people. It is and should in practice be the organic and organizing unity of a real people. The term people does not mean a shapeless multitude, proclaims the church, but a group of human persons. A people exists in the fullness of the lives of the men and women by whom it is made up. In other words, to say that we are a people is not an abstract idea. It exists in the flesh, in the beating hearts of each individual within a society. In these words spoken by Pope Pius XII and repeated by the College of Bishops in their compendium of the social teaching of the church, in these words, we begin to formulate a vision surrounding our present difficulties. Now, anyone who has ever worked with the poor, the disadvantaged, or really anyone who suffers, all right, if you've worked with any of those people, you know that there is a world of difference between what we read in the media, what we hear from political leaders, and what we then encounter on the ground, face to face, in flesh encounters with real people. I've had the privilege of working with the missionaries of charity on two different continents. That's Mother Teresa's nuns. I've walked with our poorest neighbors in conjunction with local missionaries here in Washington. I've connected more people than I can count with social services, both at the city and in Catholic charities. And there's a few things that I can tell you from these flesh and blood encounters with people, heart speaking to heart. I can tell you that the reality of actually working with real people is infinitely more nuanced and complex than the raw numbers that we see on screens and certainly more complex than the abstracted descriptions that we receive from leaders in any forum. There is a problem of inequity in our society. Let me repeat that so that there should be no doubt. There is a problem of inequity in our society. Political, judicial, economic, racial, it's all mixed up together. We can't just pull out one thread. It's all an organic, enfleshed, personal reality for the people that live it. As an abstract, it is impossible to accurately describe this inequity. But when you meet the real people, you know that there is indeed something wrong. You also know that there are real things that you and I, each of us, as individuals and as friends and neighbors, can do to help. And you also discover, working on the street, that there are some things you can't do, all right? There are limits. That's also true. I can also tell you that whatever degree of success or failure you achieve, when you work at it in the flesh, one-on-one -on -one with real people, a communion is formed. Heart speaks to heart, cor ad cor, loquitur. The person in need finds dignity, respect, and the hope needed to go on because you have been with them. 
even if your good efforts fail. Government programs and initiatives cannot do this. Their successes feel cold or metallic, and their failures sting all the more for lack of heart. State aid, laws, and procedures will only succeed insofar as they support and augment the flesh and blood decisions of real persons working together in real time. This should ring true with us not only as Christians of Trinitarian faith, but as citizens of a republic. We know that from the day of our foundation, we have depended upon each other, not on abstract ideas, not on leaders far away, but on each other. So we've described the Trinity as a union of persons, and that union of persons works in their own way for the salvation of the human race, which is itself, the human race is itself no abstract idea, but also a communion of real persons with hearts beating in real bodies. And that only when those persons work together as, as such, as persons, only then do they progress. Okay. So how are we to work together? What do we as sons and daughters of the church in particular bring to our neighbors? Again, we can turn to the words of Pope Pius XII, repeated by our contemporary bishops. Faith in God and in Jesus Christ sheds light on the moral principles that are the sole and irreplaceable foundation of that stability and tranquility and of that internal and external order that alone can generate and safeguard the prosperity of states. Let me repeat that because that was written in what in the church we call Vaticanese, it's the language of the Vatican. It's, there's lots of commas and semicolons in there, so let me make sure we, we get that again. Faith in God and in Jesus Christ sheds light on the moral principles that are the sole and irreplaceable foundation of that stability and tranquility, of that internal and external order that alone can generate and safeguard the prosperity of states. Put concisely, brothers and sisters, what we bring to the difficulty of the present moment is our faith. Now again, that might be one of those seemingly obvious statements, right? Oh yeah, my priest is telling me to bring faith to, to the world. Well, yeah, of course, what else does he say? So let's unpack it, right? Let's unpack that. Faith is not dogmatic statements though faith can be enunciated using dogmatic statements. Faith means we bring our response to the love of God present in our lives to all those that we meet. Faith means that we bring a response to the love of God which is present in our lives, and we bring that response to our neighbors. That's what faith is. For Jesus, that meant going to the cross, for the sake of the ones he loved, for those he would adopt as his fellow sons and daughters of God. What have we given of ourselves? How have we followed our Lord in giving our personal, our flesh and blood outpouring for the sake of our fellow sons and daughters of God, just as the Son did on the cross? Do we research listen to and understand the needs of all of our neighbors? Or do we fall into self-selecting algorithms that feed us only the news that we want to hear, only the figures that we want to see, the websites with which we are comfortable? Do we write to our leaders, sending the simplest of emails to enunciate a more Christian response for the sake of those who suffer poverty or injustice? Or do we assume that someone else has that covered, a think tank, a political action committee has that, that box checked? Do we walk into the voting booth and flip the simplest of switches? We know that those who vote in our country, even on what is called a high turnout year, are far too few. Do we volunteer and put ourselves on the line, put ourselves face-to-face -face 
with those in need, even if only to comfort them. In the poorest wards of our city, there are eight parishes, all of which have a heck of a time getting volunteers. I know, I served in one of them, right? It's a challenge getting people to help. In those same neighborhoods, there is one house of lay missionaries doing great person-to-person -person work, one house of nuns who take care of the poorest of the poor. Now, I can only speak for our, our local community, right? But in the Archdiocese of Washington, we have 700,000 baptized Catholics. Why, in the most suffering places, why in those neighborhoods do we not see a wave, a, a, a tsunami of volunteers, of assistants, of visitors, of teachers, of advocates from among the more fortunate parts of our community? Our response, that is to say, our faith, has been cold, even miserly. And I'm not talking about money. That would be to fall into the abstract, though, of course, money helps. I'm talking about flesh and blood. I ask that this Sunday we take time to really think, in what do I place my faith? What do I, in what do I place my faith, and how has that motivated me to put my flesh and blood at the service of the neediest among us? Is my faith placed in a political party, such that my party identification is enough? My party identification, whichever party you're in, exempts me from real personal action. Because what happens? We think, well, I'm with the good guys, right? whoever they may be, uh, and therefore, I'm covered. I don't have to go out. I'm with the party of the good. No, can't be that way, can't live that way. Is my faith in human leaders? It shouldn't be. None of them are exactly King David. In fact, King David wasn't even really King David. I mean, you know, he was imperfect too. And besides this, brothers and sisters, besides this biblical reality, in our own country, even if we look at it in a secular sense, in a republic, if we really believe in our system, we put no faith in our leaders, we put our faith in each other, not in an abstract executive far away or an abstract member of the legislature far away, but in the people who we know and see every day, blaming it on our leaders blaming it on the laws passed in Congress or not passed in Congress or in executive orders from the White House or whatever the case may be is a cop-out in a republic. We are the leaders, the citizen kings of this land. And if there's a problem, it is because we have allowed there to be a problem. But you see, brothers and sisters, the path of least resistance is so attractive, the wide road that leads to condemnation. And it gets easier and easier to ignore the problems because, after all, our tax dollars, that's, we got it taken care of. I pay my taxes. That covers it, right, doesn't it? My party is the right party. My leader is on it. But doing this, acting in this way, abrogates not only the nature of a democratic republic, it betrays the faith that we call Christianity. Christianity places its faith in the persons of the Holy Trinity, whose love expresses itself in sacrificial outpouring of my blood and sweat and tears and your blood, sweat, and tears for the sake of our neighbors. Nothing less will solve our present ills, and nothing less will get us to heaven. In the words of St. John Paul II, we must not be seduced by the naive expectation that faced with great challenges of our time, we shall find some magic formula. No, we shall not be saved by a formula, but by a person. Let me repeat that part. We shall not be saved by a formula, but by a person. And the assurance that that person gives I am with you even to the end of the age. It is not a matter of inventing a new program, the 
program already exists. It is the plan found in the gospel and in the living tradition. It is the same as ever. Ultimately, it has at its center Christ himself, who is to be known, loved, and imitated, so that in his person we may live the life of the Trinity and with him transform history. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen.